And June uh, was a record. It was the warmest June ever. It nearly got to 1.5 degrees C. Berkeley Earth reports the global average temperature at 1.47 degrees C. And it is a huge record temperature. It increased from the last June by 0.18 degrees C. That's absolutely massive. Now, no scientists, no models have ever anticipated or thought that this sort of thing would happen. This is a huge nonlinear event. Welcome to another Climate Emergency Forum. My name is Regina and I'll be your host as we discuss historic heat passing the threshold. And I gotta tell you, I'm hot just thinking about it because it is really something. Thankfully, I have some ice water here to carry me through. It's over 90 degrees over there in the window outside in New York City here in July. And it's incredible. We are seeing historic heat and its discontents. And let me tell you, it's not in just one part of the earth. It is everywhere, just everywhere. We're going to have multiple days of 90 degrees here in, in July in New York City. Normally, this is something we wouldn't see later in the month or maybe the first few weeks of August. And of course, we're not alone in all of the suffering. Now, as so many of you know, with heat, it's not just one thing. It sets off many different reactions because the climate is not this atomized entity. It is a beautiful interlocking but living thing. So when there's more heat, what happens with rain? Well, as we know, rainfall can become much more dramatic. This was predicted. James Hansen told us about it. It should be no surprise. Those of us who understood climate change knew this was going to happen. My heart goes out to the people in Vermont. Well, they suffered two months of rain in a matter of two days. They're simply ill-equipped. Now, mind you, uh, there's a tremendous amount of suffering going on there, but this is a fairly wealthy state and one of the wealthiest countries in the world. We have to have compassion with our suffering because if it is hard for us, imagine for the people who don't have a financial system that can help people in need, who don't have the abundance of insurance that can help people in need, who don't have the readily available services, helicopters that's picking people off of rooftops to save their lives. So many countries don't have this. And I said, it's not just heat in our atmosphere. The oceans are warming precipitously. We are talking ocean temperatures upwards of 90 degrees. You know, we humans, we've evolved. We have many different ways to cool down. If it's too hot outside, we can turn to air conditioning. Our bodies sweat so that the air can cool our bodies and our internal organs are protected that way. We can drink water that's cooled with ice. Fish and mammals in the ocean don't have the same luxuries we have. They cannot rapidly evolve to withstand these tremendously warming temperatures. There are living beings who have narrow bands of temperature that they can withstand. Human beings can live in the mountaintop with ice. They can live in Hawaii. This is not the case with all living beings. We cannot allow this to happen, and yet we are. Many, many species food that other creatures in the ocean eat. If they cannot thrive in certain temperatures, what are the other animals going to feed off of? There are animals such as whales who travel along with the food that they eat. And if there are no 
places that are temperate or suited to the temperature of the lower food chain, this is going to have epic, epic consequences. And I want to turn this over to Dr. Peter Carter, who is passionate on this subject. I know that you've done some research on this, so please share with us, Peter. Thanks, Regina, and thank you for uh, bringing in the fact that, which is too rarely uh, brought up, that of course what's happening is affecting uh, all of life on, on our planet here. It's not just us, uh, far from it. So the uh, media had quite a few heydays at the beginning of this month of July 2023 because we had one record hottest day after another after another. We had a, at least a week at the beginning of this month in which this week was the hottest week worldwide on record. And this was recently confirmed by the World Meteorological Organization, no less. We also, though, and I want to start with Berkeley Earth, were pretty hot off the press because they're the first climate center to issue their report of June of 2023. And June uh, was a record. It was the warmest June ever. It nearly got to 1.5 degrees C. Berkeley Earth reports the global average temperature at 1.47 degrees C. And it is a huge record temperature. It increased from the last June by 0 0.18 degrees C. That's absolutely massive. Now, no scientists, no models have ever anticipated or thought that this sort of thing would happen. This is a huge non-linear event. The global ocean as well, a huge record for June this year, 2023, and that beat the previous 2016 record in June, that being the uh, past big El Nino. And of course, we're just coming into an El Nino at this time. And there was a lot of attention given by some smart people who uh, managed to spot that crazy things were happening in the North Atlantic temperature. The North Atlantic was a record by a huge margin. It just shot up. That was practically 1.5 degrees C. And this was associated with a marine heat wave around the UK um, in North Sea which got a lot of media attention because these things are completely out of line of the kind of situation with global warming and climate change that we've been following. Although, as James Hansen has been pointing out for some time, our global warming situation is accelerating. We're in an accelerating situation. The, uh, the smart people who spotted these sudden jumps in temperature, used the uh, climate reanalyzer. That's the uh, University of Maine. And they have this practically real time. They give us not only the ocean, the sea surface temperature, and the sea surface temperatures have increased faster than anything else. The other th measure that we get from uh, the uh, climate reanalyzer is the two meter air temperature. And so they both have been uh, going up at an absolutely alarming rate. With regards to the uh, air temperature, the overall air temperature, we have had a record temperatures for a matter of weeks. The Northern Hemisphere has been at its record hottest for three weeks. And the Northern Hemisphere has been showing, as I've noticed previously, an earlier, more rapid, longer sustained increase here. That's very important because there's also a couple of recent papers come out on the Northern Hemisphere vulnerability to its food security. So if we've got these uh, literal spikes of uh, temperature and food as well has to be caught in our thoughts. With respect to the uh, sea surface, absolutely is completely astounding. We've had almost a three month daily record sea surface temperatures. And there's a gap between what's happening this month with the sea surface and what's been happening in all previous months, which is widening. In other words, we have a record sea surface temperature, which is getting more and more and more of a record. And um, it's just kicked back up again. And again, then the North Atlantic 
we're talking uh, extraordinary temperatures here. We're talking of a uh, sea surface temperature of 20.9 degrees C. These are absolutely outlandish, totally unexpected in anybody's worst imagination. So I suppose I could say that would be me. Nobody ever anticipated anything like this happening. So, of course, why is it happening? Well, I find that interesting because mostly what we've got are some uh, sort of interesting things. Experts talking about Sahara dust, also uh, experts talking about the El Nino. But I noticed that the WMO and uh, Copernicus have both said that they can't see that this huge increase in temperatures has much to do with El Nino because it's too weak at the moment to be doing stuff like this. And this is temperature stuff, which we've never seen before. We didn't see this with the big El Nino in, uh, in 1516, for example, nothing like this. There's been a couple of interesting long papers come out recently on Earth energy imbalance. And at the bottom of this situation, of course, is the increase in uh, atmospheric greenhouse gas concentrations, which in turn puts our Earth energy balance out. So Earth energy balance, which is a favorite of Jimmy Hansen's, has doubled in the past 20, 30, depending on which paper you... So there's been a huge, huge explosive increase in the total Earth energy imbalance. And so really, we have to expect this sort of uh, huge, big spike jumps in these temperatures. So it's the greenhouse gas emissions is what it is. Atmospheric CO2 concentration has now reached above 421 parts per million, over a 50% increase, and it is accelerating as it always has been. So over the past month or two, atmospheric CO2 has increased at an accelerating rate. And of course then, I think most of us have heard on the methane emergency, Methane is still increasing at an explosive rate since about 2020, 21. And even nitrous oxide is increasing at an accelerating rate. So despite the interesting aspects of the Sahara dust, etc., which I'm sure that is a factor, the big factor is we're still pouring atmospheric global warming greenhouse gases into the lower atmosphere and so the lower atmosphere is simply in an explosive heat situation right now. And uh, we should not be in the least bit surprised, although we were, to get these uh, phenomenal huge increasing spikes in actual temperature. So I'll finish with that one. Although I want to mention, I mean, of course, my thing is the, uh, is the climate emergency and the planetary emergency. This is more than a code red emergency. We should have or have had all our scientists sort of alarmed, up in arms, pushing for immediate action internationally. Nothing so far. We have to react to this. Uh, we should have reacted years ago, but to this one, oh my God, yes. So, okay, there you go. Emergency. Thank you, Peter. We hear you loud and clear. It is not lost on me that these record temperatures for the oceans have been calculated in June, which is, of course, World Oceans Month. Very, very devastating. Paul, I hear that there's some weather weirding afoot. Can you share with us your thoughts on that? Yes. Well, Peter has very nicely sort of given lots of examples of how bad the situation is with the heating and we're getting more and more extreme rainfall events, torrential rainfall events as well. And that's directly related to the heating because for every degree Celsius rise in temperature, there's 7% more water vapor in the atmosphere. And that water vapor rises and condenses and it releases enormous amounts of energy to fuel these very intense events. And the jet streams are moving more slowly. So these storms, like the one that passed recently through, you know, eastern Canada, through the eastern U.S., Vermont, and, you know, up into Quebec was another example of, you know, a place that doesn't do too well in the climate casino. It gets two months of its uh, regular rainfall in, in two days. The state capital was pretty much underwater 
in, in Vermont. And, you know, these sort of things, these are beyond what people expect, right? They just, they're, they're much far and beyond what anybody imagines unless you're um, a regular subscriber to this program and then less and less of this is surprising you. The temperatures that we're reaching, the temperature humidity combinations are getting extremely detrimental to human health. We know about the massive Texas heat wave, northern Mexico heat wave that was ongoing for three, four weeks. We reached temperature humidity combinations approaching the wet bulb temperature. This is a first, I believe, for the, for the U.S. You know, we associate these sort of high temperature, high humidity reaching points where people can't work outside. They can't do anything. They can't even sit outside in the shade. You know, their body overheats, they get heat exhaustion, uh, heat stroke, and die in a matter of like eight to 10 hours outside if the temperature's higher than 35 with 100% humidity. And you can work out the corresponding wet bulb for, say, 40 Celsius or 45 Celsius. We're reaching 50 degrees Celsius in regions. And then not only do we have to worry about the wet bulb conditions being exceeded, but when we talk about temperatures 50, 45, 50, we're talking about the breakdown of certain chemicals that make up the body, like proteins, for example. You know, think of what what happens when you uh, crack an egg over a, and expose it to 50 degree temperatures. The clear part of the egg turns white, and this is basically denaturation of the protein uh, molecules. They become broken and all twisted and you know, make the egg clear part of the egg go white. And, you know, this is actually happening. These chemical breakdowns can actually start occurring in the human body when we reach those sort of temperatures, 50 degrees plus. So we have that to be concerned with. Yeah, there's only so much the the, the human body can take, the physiology, let alone the animals and plant species that are just they're way outside their, their comfortable niche with these sort of conditions. James Hansen was talking about how the planet was warming 0.18 degrees Celsius per decade. You know, and Peter just mentioned that, you know, if you compare this June to the previous June, we increased about 0.18 degrees Celsius. That's in one year, <laughs> let alone a decade. And Hansen's paper, Global Warming in the Pipeline, also clearly shows that according to their numbers, the uh, rate of temperature rise is no longer 0.18 degrees Celsius per decade. It's 50 to 100 percent higher than that. So it's somewhere between 0.27 and 0.36 degrees Celsius per decade from 2010 onwards. You know, we're also getting very non-uniform, non-linear heating. Some parts of the world are hit worse than others, but the, the heat is widespread. And it is too early, really, to be attributable just to the El Nino, because the El Nino is just really getting going. So bad as things are today, I think in a year we'll do a video, or maybe sooner, and say, it's unbelievable how we blew away these records that were set back in 2023 in uh, June. Another thing I want to mention is that the ocean temperatures, yeah, the ocean temperatures in the North Atlantic are unbelievably warm. It takes a lot of energy to heat up water. Antarctic sea ice is at record lows from very, very warm ocean water down there. One of the ideas for the huge water temperatures, warm temperatures in the North Atlantic is a paper came out not too long ago talking about how the jet streams tend to get locked into modes of five or seven where there's five ridge trough, ridge trough, five times repeated around the planet in the Northern Hemisphere. And in the ridges, it's very hot, very little rainfall. And in the troughs, a lot of rainfall. And when those troughs and ridges overlap crop growing regions for grains and, and corn and things like that, we can expect yield drops. So the risk of that is getting higher and higher. And also, you know, lots of food is being produced by, uh, they call it blue food, whether it's food from the ocean or food from freshwater sources, whether you're catch whether it's fish catch or for aquaculture and 90 percent of those regions are uh, being threatened yields are being threatened and that feeds about 3.2 billion people the, the food the blue blue food component so all of these things are sort of converging and happening at the moment so it's not not a good situation definitely not a good situation at all paul 
And uh, I really appreciate that you mentioned uh, our subscribers. And I agree, our subscribers are probably, well, they're surprised at this, but as we are surprised, but our subscribers are knowledgeable. And those of you who are first time watchers, we encourage you to be a subscriber. Click that like button and hit the bell. We have a show coming out every week. And as Paul said, and I, I got to tell you, I, I hated hearing it. As much as we're saying that this is really crazy, out of control and intense, months, years down the road, we may be saying that again. It's it's just, it's dumbfounding, okay? It is dumbfounding. And in terms of mentioning dumbfounding, I, I'm astonished. I am absolutely astonished and disgusted by the entities who are still promulgating the idea, the canard, that climate change is a hoax. It is just at this point, you know, and I know that we shouldn't waste our time going there, but at this point, it is something that is just so profoundly warped that it's beyond comprehension. People are dying other living beings are dying. Our very planet is dying. And we have done this. We have done this. We have to think of something, as Michael Mann says, as bad as it is and as bad as it could be, we have to prevent it from getting worse as much as we can. Because for every bit of warming that we have, things become stepwise worse. So... We're not going to make things better necessarily, but what we're looking to is to stop making it worse. Stop making this a planet where there's no birds in the sky and no fish in the sea. I want to turn it back over to Peter. What we have been doing for many years as a society, a civilization, but primarily as a perverse economy is completely and absolutely insane. I can I can give you a, a couple of figures which will just show you how insane it is. Uh, Paul has mentioned that the um, Antarctica, Antarctica was at a record ever low a couple of months ago. It's now refreezing at a record low rate. The temperature increases in Antarctica are absolutely crazy. 4.45 degrees C, higher than a 20th century average, over four degrees higher in Antarctica. And um, it's not only around the waters, it's not only around the Southern Ocean. This huge heat increase is actually, for the first time that I know of, affected the main East Antarctica continent. So um, uh, we are in the biggest, biggest trouble, far beyond my imagination ever. We've not kept an eye on the oceans. This is a big part of why we find ourselves here like this. There's a huge energy imbalance, as I've mentioned, as Dr. Hansen had been saying for decades, it's obviously not getting through. Total energy imbalance where the air, where the uh, climate situation is, as I say, an explosive state. In just 50 years, we have added energy to the oceans equivalent to 25 billion Hiroshima atomic bombs. 25 billion of these bombs in just a matter of a few decades. That is absolutely insane. And what's happening is, I believe, the main thing is that this is now uh, catching us up. I, I think that, yeah, El Nino starting, but I think we're getting some uh, heat feedback from the oceans kicking in. Uh, something that um, James Lovelock in uh, 2000 and in his 2008 book projected would happen, that we cannot keep in putting these huge amounts of energy into the ocean and getting away with it on land. And we're not getting away with it anymore. Because at the same time, we are now putting in, the uh, ocean experts tell me, heat at a rate of 11 Hiroshima bombs detonated per second. A couple of years ago, it was four per second. There was five. Last year, it was seven. Now they're saying it's nine and 11. So um, we're blowing up our planet 
we're literally blowing up our planet. We need, and Antonio Guterres is doing a wonderful job on this uh, onerous file of climate disruption. Yeah, he says we have to uh, jump to it. He says that we're losing control of the climate system. And in his words, he said, I think we're going into a planetary catastrophe. And he's right. What this needs is the entire world to unite, cooperate, and in a vast venture for us to try and save ourselves and save life on this planet. The very worst evil of all this, and this is clearly an evil situation, is that instead of doing that, we're making um, terrible weapons of mass destruction and we're having a horrible bloody war in the middle of Europe. This has to stop. It has to stop. And all of that energy and resources has to be applied to our planet so that we might have a future. My last words are to remind you that the IPCC 6 assessment said, we have a narrow window in which to secure a livable, sustainable future. That meant our time is up. So um got to listen to the IPCC when they say things like that. Thank you for that, Peter. And as you have said so many times, the IPCC is notoriously conservative in its estimates. So absolutely, if they are speaking in these dire terms, well, we better pay attention. It's all very difficult to be a part of the species sometimes, I have to admit. Pa, oh, what are your thoughts? Close us out. Do you have any hope to offer us? Yeah, it, it's, uh, you know, clearly we're, we're completely heading in the wrong direction. You know, there's enough signs around the world of how bad things really are. And yet, uh, you know, politicians still manage to, uh, you know, downplay them or ignore them. And countries still manage to do the exact opposite of what they should be doing. I mean, we should be slashing and cutting fossil fuels, clearly. But instead of that, we're subsidizing them at ever higher rates. And as a result, greenhouse gases are rising in the atmosphere at ever record rates. And, uh, you know, everything is heading in the wrong direction. I had a nice peaceful uh, few hours at Crawford Lake, which has been in the news. You may have heard of it um, as being perhaps the golden spike, if you like, the dividing line between the Holocene, you know, which was a stable climate conducive to human development and human growth from hunter-gatherers to highly industrialized civilization, you know, dividing line. But now we seem to be, uh, you know, many people are saying we're in sort of an Anthropocene state where human impact on the planet is just massive and, uh, you know, all invasive everywhere. And part of it, you know, is, of course, this, this incredible warming that we're seeing of atmosphere oceans. We've changed the chemistry of the atmosphere oceans. We're putting ever more heat into the climate system and, you know, there's enormous consequences that we're, we're seeing. You know, I just want to reiterate, it takes a lot of energy to heat ocean water. So the idea that the North Atlantic is five or six degrees warmer than normal, you know, off the UK and stuff. And, you know, that's being attributed. I think the, the main cause is this Greenland blocking situation that's occurring, which causes the jet streams to get in this wave number five or seven mode. And this is really going to, you know, as a high risk to our, our global food supply. Also, aerosols ha do provide a cooling effect on the planet. And, you know, we, we're cutting, we've cut sulfur in marine fuels to reduce aerosols. But if we do that too quickly, and then we can get tremendous warming spikes, you know, half a degree, up to even a degree because of the reduction of aerosols. And James Hansen thinks that that is one of the main contributing factors to these record high temperatures in the North Atlantic. And, you know, as the Arctic warms because of Arctic temperature amplification by itself, there's less heat going there from the equator. So more heat is going into the Southern Hemisphere or staying at the equator causing you know record temperatures and approaching wet bulb at, at the equator but also causing you know record ice melt and warming in, in antarctica so the whole climate system is is connected for sure and we're seeing abrupt uh, climate system change occurring you know sort of in real time more and more often thank you for that paul it's the abruptness that's so disconcerting 
In addition to the abruptness, as I mentioned, our species is disconcerting. Uh, I want to just share with you before we close out, I was reading uh, an article that I, when I first saw it, I thought, gee, you know, I'll, it's clickbait. Let me go ahead and read this article. It's about uh, a sea otter in California that is apparently stealing surfboards from surfers. Somehow it's become problematic. I don't know. Maybe some of these surfboards are expensive. Who knows? Maybe the sea otter, apparently she's great at riding waves and there's some jealousy. I'm not sure. But the officials in California have said that hopefully the sea otter won't bite a surfer because then they will have to euthanize her. And what they're working on now is to capture her so that they can put her somewhere, an aquarium or something. And I'm sitting here thinking, what kind of craziness is this? So we have an endangered species and we've got this bonehead species that is using the endangered species home to recreate. And our solution is to take that endangered species and put it in a cage, okay? Homo sapiens, we have a problem, okay? And it is us. We need to wake up. Please, I know you watching are awake. Talk to your friends, share these stories, share our findings and let people know. Shake them if you have to. We have to change because we are at the edge of an abyss. So I want to thank you very, very much for being with us. And we look forward to seeing you next time at the Climate Emergency Forum.